Horatio Spafford was born in Troy, New York in 1828. He moved to Chicago where he met and married Anna Larson in 1861. By 1870, he had become a wealthy senior partner in a large law firm. He was a successful businessman, having invested heavily in real estate in North Chicago. He also served as an elder in a Presbyterian church. The Spaffords were supporters and friends with the well-known evangelist Dwight L. Moody. They lived happily in Lakeview with their four daughters. They could certainly say at this time in their lives that all was well. But their earthly fortunes would soon change. On October 8, 1871, the ever-present threat of fire in the crowded city of Chicago broke out. Old wooden buildings and sidewalks quickly went up in flames, fanned by winds off Lake Michigan. Within two days, at least 300 people were dead, 100,000 homeless, and $200 million worth of property destroyed, including Spafford's real estate investments and law firm. By 1873, Spafford, concerned about Anna's health, planned a family trip to England to participate in revival services led there by Dwight Moody and music evangelist Ira Sankey. Just before they left, their dwindling finances took another hit during the Panic of 1873. Though he was detained by last-minute business concerns, he sent Anna and the four girls ahead, whom he would follow in a few days. Spafford booked passage for his wife, 11-year-old Anna, 9-year-old Maggie Lee, 5-year-old Elizabeth, and 2-year-old Tanetta, who joined 308 other passengers aboard the French steamship Ville de Havre in New York. They set sail on November 15, 1873. About one week into the crossing, at 2 a.m. on November 22nd, the Ville de Havre collided with the iron-hulled Scottish ship, the Loch Ern. The Loch Ern rang the ship's bell and ported its helm, while the Ville de Havre put to starboard, but it was too late. The Ville de Havre was nearly broken in two. Anna hurried her daughters from their berths to the deck, where all was chaos. Having been told that the ship would soon sink, there she knelt down and prayed that God would either save them or make them willing to die. The Ville de Havre sank into the cold, murky waters of the Atlantic in only 12 minutes. 226 souls were lost. While rowing a small boat, a sailor spotted a woman clinging to a piece of the wreckage. It was Anna, still alive, but all four of her daughters had drowned. Another vessel landed them in Cardiff, Wales, nine days later. There she cabled her husband the famed message that began, Saved alone, what shall I do? One of the ship's survivors later recalled Anna saying, God gave me four daughters. Now they have been taken from me. Someday I will understand why. Horatio immediately left Chicago for Liverpool. As he crossed the Atlantic, the captain called Horatio to his cabin to say that, by his best reckoning, they were passing over the spot where his daughters perished. He wrote to his wife's half-sister, On Thursday last we passed over the spot where she went down, in mid-ocean, the waters three miles deep. But I do not think of our dear ones there. They are safe folded, the dear lambs. Ira Sankey said that Dwight Moody left his meetings in Edinburgh and went to Liverpool to comfort the bereaved parents and was pleased to find that they were able to say, It is well, the will of God be done. The Spaffords returned to Chicago where, in 1876, they entertained Ira Sankey in their home for several weeks. According to Sankey, that is when Horatio penned the words of the hymn, It is well with my soul, in commemoration of the death of his children. Sankey stated that the comforting fact in connection with this incident was that in one of our small meetings in North Chicago a short time prior to their sailing for Europe, the children had been converted. As heart-rending as their losses were, these events were not the end of the Spafford sorrows. In 1875, they were blessed with the birth of a son, Horatio Gates Spafford II. But before he turned five, their son died of scarlet fever. However, in 1878 and 1881, respectively, daughters Bertha and Grace were born. In what is perhaps the most tragic part of the story, Spafford began to drift away from evangelical truth and adopt unusual notions and questionable business practices. He became obsessed with date setting for the second coming, a supposed golden earthly age of a thousand years, messages and visitations from God, a denial of hell, false prophecies, and many other rather extreme practices. With growing opposition, Spafford and some of his followers found it expedient to leave the country. In August of 1881, this messianic sect left for Jerusalem, where they established the American colony and lived communally to wait for the second coming. Near the end, Spafford even imagined himself to be the Messiah, though this was likely the result of delirium from malaria. On October 16, 1888, Horatio Spafford died of malaria. Anna Spafford passed away many years later in 1923. 
But the tragedies surrounding this hymn did not begin and end with the sinking of a ship. Spafford penned the famous words of the hymn, but Philip P. Bliss composed the tune, which he dubbed Ville de Havre, after the ship that took the Spafford's daughters. The complete hymn was published by Bliss and Sankey in 1876. It was first sung by Bliss himself before a large gathering of ministers hosted by Moody on November 24, 1876. After Christmas, only one month later, Bliss wired D.L. Moody that he, his wife Lucy, and his two sons, Paul and George, would soon be arriving in Chicago. In the telegram, he said, tickets for Chicago, via Buffalo and Lakeshore Railroad, shall be in Chicago Friday night. God bless you all forever. At the last minute, they decided to leave the two boys with Bliss's mother. Philip and Lucy departed on a cold, blizzardy December 29, 1876. At 8 o'clock p.m., on crossing over a ravine near Ashtabula, Ohio, the bridge carrying the train collapsed, and one of two engines and 11 passenger coaches carrying about 160 people plunged 75 feet into the icy river below. Five minutes later, fire broke out and fanned by gale-force winds quickly enveloped the wreckage. Two-thirds of the passengers perished in the wreck and the fire. Philip, however, was able to free himself and escape through a window. He returned to pull his wife Lucy out, but found her to be hopelessly pinned in the twisted iron of the wreckage. When he found that he could not save her, he bravely remained at her side until both were consumed by the flames. In 1877, an eyewitness wrote, he would not escape by deserting his noble wife, and they went home together in a baptism of fire. The newspapers reported all that remained was a charred mass. No trace of their bodies was ever discovered. Seven tragic deaths surround this hymn. For some, the circumstances of life and death could not touch their souls. For others, the thorns of affliction grew and choked. It is difficult to assess how such tragedies influence Bafford's theological drift. But perhaps one may both take warning and have compassion that there but for the grace of God go any of us. Yet, like others, we may hold confidently and exuberantly to the blessed assurance and hope of the gospel. For one who rests in Christ and his atoning sacrifice, nothing in life or death can change his standing with God. This is why Job, despite the horrors of affliction, could ask, What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? It is why he could cry out, Though he slay me, yet will I hope in him. This is why Paul could declare, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. And this is why he could say, But whatever gain I had, I count it as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. This is why Jesus said, For whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? And this is why, if we were to take all the losses we experience in life and add them to the loss of death, they would never add up to the gain we have in Christ. And so, when sorrows billow over us and threaten to sink us, we may confidently sing, My sin, O oh, the bliss of this glorious thought, my sin, not in part but the whole, is nailed to the cross, and I bear it no more. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh, my soul. And so, whatever my lot, thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. <laughs>